Now, for those of you that don't know, the injection pump, the CP4, as you can see from the service info, I take it, you know, if you don't know, it's actually a time pump. You got to, you know, phase it, or as people like to call it, you're timing it. So in this case, make sure you line up the gear with the two marks facing with 12 o'clock of the cam. So you can actually take the vacuum pump that sits in front of that. And therefore, you'll be able to see the gear, take the gear off. So the gear's got to come off in order to get the injection pump off. So word to the wise there, if you haven't done one. That's why in front of the gear, we see a notch right there. And that's the notch, notch that drives the vacuum pump there. So there you go. And there's a pretty picture of the VCV right there. So that's another component. If you have access to it, definitely want to get access to it to also check for contamination. But to me, it's easier to inspect the PCV first than it is to check the VCV on the ejection pump there. So there you go. Okay. Again, please feel free to ask questions. So what is my biggest beef? Like I even talked on my Power Stroke 6-7 uh, uh, webinar in class that we have on our on-demand classes is that there are companies selling you complete kits to replace everything when there's catastrophic damage. So the question begs, what's going wrong, right? Because it's getting to the point that uh, they're actually you know, going back to CP3. Now I called one of my guys over at Bosch and I said, you know, I got a question for you. I remember a long time ago when we were playing with the CP3 pump on a test stand. And I remember that CP3 pump doesn't do well above 25,000 PSI. Yet the CP4 can hit 29 and now it's hitting 36,000. So the CP3, as stout as it is, a little heavy, little damn injection pump as it is, cast iron, all that, you know, it really does not do well. So how are these guys getting away with it on a 6.7? Because the computer is going to demand. So they're like, well, they're just uh, really playing with the duty cycle on that volume control valve. In other words, the M-prop, as we called it here on this CP3 pump. So do I believe you're stressing the holy crap out of a CP3 when you put it in a 6.7? Yes. Yes, the pressures are high. So if you, like me, you know, I've had the, you know, uh, you know the, how, what's the, the privilege of working with Bosch and in this case of asking him, hey, you know, and seeing these pumps, what they were designed to do, the CP3. And the thing is, a lot of guys that sell these kits, you know, oh, we, we updated. What did you update? What can you do in reality? You know, you would have to modify everything on that pump. So therefore, now, sidebar though, the new coming 6.7 for 2021 went left the CP4 and went back to CP3 now. But they're saying Bosch is telling me that it is a, you know, a CP3 on steroids. In other words, it's been updated. So I wouldn't be surprised seeing these guys sell kits where they're putting that CP3 point whatever version on there on a 6.7. But CP3s go bad too. So therefore. So what is uh, so great about the CP3? Yes, it is a reliable pump. Yes, it's been a good pump. And I've done a few, but not a whole bunch, right? And the CP4 has been problematic. Why? Because there's the weakness on the lower right. The CP4 weakness has been low pump pressure and volume. Okay, low pump pressure and volume. That is what kills it. And if you're going to give me shit about it, excuse my language, but it does get on my nerves. Nobody seemed to take, you know, complain about when we went through the VP44 phase back in 99 with the 5.9 Cummins. What was the weakness of that system that took out the injection pump back in the day? Was low lip pump pressure and volume, right? Same thing here. This injection pump, you know, does not do well with low lift pump pressure and volume. That's why you got to heat to the messages on the dash. But after talking with a few guys and talking for a few instructors and even, you know, some of the Bosch people, I asked them, you know, what takes out the CP4 pump? Yes, again, low lift pump pressure and volume. But when does this happen? I mean, this pump, you know, the supply inject, excuse me, the supply lift pump that Ford puts in there is damn good. So when I see a guy put a fast pump or an air dog and some crap, I said, well, you're just wasting your money because the Ford pump kicks ass. You know, it's really moving. It's got a capability of three times the volume that it would necessarily need to take, you know. So, yeah, there's squilling pumps and so on. But to say that it's a high failure item, no. So the moral of the story is why then is this pump giving us issue on a four, six, seven? And they're saying mostly it occurs at service. And that is so true. I've seen guys do. I've visited shops. I've helped guys at shop. And I've asked questions. And the thing is, you're doing the fuel filter service all wrong okay you're doing it all wrong because 
you know, even read the Ford Service procedure if you don't believe me. You know, they're telling you, you know, put the filters in, and then when you're done, you're supposed to prime the pump. Once you get it started, after you've done several key cycles, or you run it with your scan tool, you start up the truck and you let it idle for at least 10 minutes. Just let it sit there and let it work its air out for the first 10 minutes. Many guys are done. They primed it, fired up. We're good. Boom, put it in reverse, get it out of the stall. And we're good to go. No, that's where the issues happen because you can still have some air in the system. So if, if I can't teach you another thing, I know that I said that earlier, but learn how to do fuel filters correctly on these 6.7s. Prime the system. Make sure you're getting, like I showed you on that YouTube video, make sure that you're actually not have a low pressure message it'll even display it on the dash too so heat to that and if not fix that get rid of that air and then at that point let her sit for 10 15 i like 15 minutes i'll sit there i'll go wash my hands i'll go start reading about my next job or take a phone call and just let the truck run there you know let it work its out then i'm comfortable taking out and nailing the crap out of it and see what happens so there you go okay so yes big deal in terms of you know, taking care of low fuel pressure, low volume, and air. So, yeah. So, there you go. Thank you, Mr. James. So, <clears throat> all right. So, when you look at the, also at the injection pump, the CP4 pump, please note the CP4 pump, as you can see, and, and you better, I'm going to focus on this puppy here. Let me, come on, baby, work here. Um, there you go. Look at that. You see one lobe and you see another lobe. So, therefore, for one given revolution of the CP4 pump, the, there are two lobes, so therefore there are two plungers here, and each plunger is displacing twice. So therefore, in this case, there are two displacement per plunger, so four strokes of pressurization that takes place on one rotation of the CP4 pump. The CP3, like we just discussed, has three plungers, and it displaces one per revolution, so therefore only three. So that would mean the CP4 out displaces the CP3 as well. So there you go. So another reason why we say you ought to stick. Now, those of you that work in this business and deal with other diesels, how many other manufacturers use this pump and don't see those issues? Isuzu, right? Isuzu is a good example. Isuzu uses this and we don't see a lot of pump failures. Yeah, we find metal, but the thing is, it's not a high failure item to say that I see metal on every Isuzu that comes in with a CP4 pump. No. So therefore we see that too. All right, all right, so there you go. So what about my way of doing testing? As you know, I have a reputation for doing things my way that I feel can work very well. So let's draw the scenario, okay? Because you, I hope you can use this tomorrow. That's the whole objective. And in this case, the truck comes in, no rail pressure. You crank, 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 and you can see maybe up to 200 PSI if you're lucky, you know, of actual rail pressures, designer 6,000, 7,000, and you're only getting that little bit, right? So what are you going to do now? Well, first of all, I'm going to make sure, again, I got low lip pump pressure, go, excuse me, lip pump pressure going up to the secondary fuel filter, right? So you can go ahead, like I said, put a gauge for 58 PSI, or you can go ahead and look at that low pressure switch and see if it, on the scan to the displays low or high pressure being available coming to the injection pump, right? Okay. So I got that. So then at that point, I go, okay, the next step is I want to know if this puppy is contaminated. I'm not going to waste my time because if this thing is, maybe the owner put freaking death fluid in it or there is contamination because he didn't change it or maybe the CP4 did take a dump, right? I'm open to that. So I go after who again? The PCV valve. Easy things to get to. So remove the PCV valve. Again, this is Tony's way. Read the top of the slide. Tony likes to save time. I take the PCV valve. I put a plastic container that I made from milk carton. I put it under there and I have somebody or I'll crank the motor right there in the engine compartment because I could get to the starter wire going there or I can use the relay, whatever. But in this case, um, I crank it over and I check to see if there's any fluid coming out of that PCV hole at the end of that rail. And sometimes chunks of metal come out. It's like, well, Tell the customer he's screwed because now we're probably looking at the whole fuel system. And what are we talking about? Rail, lines, injectors. Yes, that's the worst case. But does it happen a lot? No. So in this case, I inspect the PCV, see if it's damaged. Remember the diverter valve? I mean, the diverter valve actually causing problems? Yep. PCV looks fine. Okay. So therefore, I'm losing pressure from somewhere. So the million dollar question is, do I got a leak or do I have a bad pump? 
Pumps can go bad, right? So in this case, that can happen. Now you can get a scenario too, where the truck comes in and it's doggy. I mean, it runs, but it's got no power and you're gonna see rail pressure really low too, but it runs, right? So in this case, same procedure. I'm still gonna make sure that the PCB is not damaged and I'm gonna also make sure there's no contamination. Can we get that out of the way? Okay, so on the injection pump, like we said, we got the VCV valve, which is on the low pressure side. So I'm going to take off that P, excuse me, I'm going to take off that P, VCV valve. I'm going to take that VCV valve. I'm going to inspect it to see if it's got any contamination. So we got that out of the way. So now I'm not building enough rail pressure. So what I'm going to do, well, I need to find who's the leaker. Again, do I have a leaker through a return of injector or B, is it the injection pump? So I need to get, it's either injectors or it's either what? The injection pump. So what do I do? Tony's way. Well, I'll tell you what Tony likes to do. Now, this is Tony's way. Okay. I'm not endorsing Bosch or Ford right now. I'm talking Tony's way. What does Tony do? Well, Tony says, well, hell, I can actually get my caps. So yeah, I'm a big user of caps. Okay. There's the cap. So I'm a big freedom racer purchaser. They got, they take my money all the time. And in this case, they sell caps. Your local Snap-on tool truck sells caps. So there you go. Invest money on caps. If not, take an old line, weld it shut like we have done too. And you can have your own cap you can make if you're a cheapskate. So there you go. Yeah, you're a cheapskate. These caps make life a lot easier, okay? There, there. So therefore, Tony's a big cap user because he still has got his caps that he uses from Cummins and from the Duramax application. It's a Bosch common real system. Anyways. There is a line, like we said already, that transfers fuel from the one rail to the other rail, isn't there? So therefore, I will take this line off and cap it. I just shut fuel off to four injectors. So if all of a sudden, and the sensor's still in play here, you'll notice the sensor is still there. So I can still read it off my scan tool. So in this case, I'm gonna crank the engine over and I'm going to see if, it's, if it runs, it's going to run like dog crap, but at least I'm going to look at my pressures now on my scan tool. Look desired in action. And if it now builds rail pressure, then I know that the problem is in one of those four on the passenger side. Agreed? So I already know that. Let that sink in there for a minute, okay? So that makes life easy to me. It's easy. Okay, now we're going to address those in a second. Now, let's say that rail pressure still wasn't being built, no change. Okay, we're gonna leave that cap there. So how many injectors do I got here? I got four. So what I'm gonna do now is these, this is the easy side for me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one, oops, I'm gonna take one line at a time and I'm gonna cap these four. So I'm gonna cap one at a time. If I don't build any rail pressure at this point, then who's bad? What's left? Injection pump, there you go. That's Tony's way of doing it. I'm not doing no damn volume test. I'm not doing no, no, hell no, no. It's This is the quick and easy way. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tony, this is a good idea. I know what you're thinking. Tony's great. No, I'm kidding. But here's the deal. This line is not reusable. <laughs> Tony's a little sneaky, all right? Those of you that worked in this industry know that if I, this, this only is good for one time, one time only, because I've tried to do it more than one time, is that these lines are what we call a crush fit once they go in there. So what I do is I take the end and I sand it. And then at that point, I put it back on and guess what? It seals, okay? It works. So obviously I don't follow their torque procedure. I go, you know, Tony elbow tight and make sure it don't leak, the bastard, you know? But it works, it holds, I make sure, and boy, do I scrutinize it, I make sure it don't leak, but that's off the record. But you guys know what I'm talking about when you find yourselves in those positions that you got to get it out of here. Why? Because this line is no fun to do. Okay, it is no fun to do, especially when it goes underneath the EGR cooler on a uh, on the 6.7 because it goes underneath the EGR cooler, so that's no fun. Unless you want to take the EGR cooler, replace the line, charge the labor, that's up to you. But I like to make the line easy, but I have been known to do that. It's a no-no in a way, but hey, you got to do what you got to do, you know, and it's, it's, it works, it seals, okay? So, so recap, what does Tony like to do? Again, truck comes in. I want to make sure you understand this. You, you're welcome to do this procedure. Hopefully you're taking notes. Here we go. Truck comes in with an, not adequate high rail pressure. I confirmed I got good lift pump 
pressure coming in, right? At that point, what I'm going to do is, okay, I'm not building real pressure. I'm going to check for contamination, right? Check for any debris. I'm going to remove the PCV. It's the easiest thing to get to, right? I take the PCV off. I put a little container underneath it. I crank the engine over. And at that point, I'm trying to see what's moving out of there. And I got to tell you, it's a red flag when you crank and nothing comes out of the rail. They're like, whoa, the pump's not moving anything. So, so therefore, at that point, you know, pump's most likely the problem. But you got to be careful about this because you're like saying, well, could I have an injector issue too? Yeah, but you're going to start off at the pump. Okay, let's get that clear. So at this point, though, I've checked for contamination. Now I'm going to isolate who's my leaker or do I have a bad pump? So at this point, what I'm going to do is I take that transfer line off. I cap it. I took these four out of play. And now at this point, I crank it over because the fuel rail pressure sensor is still in play. And at that point, I check to see if I build rail pressure. Okay? I build rail pressure. All right? If I do, then I know that I got four leakers on the other side, and we'll talk about how to address that. But if I still don't build rail pressure, then I'm going to go one cap at a time, you know, capping these four on this side and checking to see who's my leaker. So... Therefore, it makes life a lot easier. So now at this point, if you capped off this side by capping off this line, so this side is out of play, and you cap these four now, then therefore, and you still don't build rail pressure, then what's bad? The pump. So therefore, you've got that, a bad injection pump. There you go. Does that help? Well, you tell me your opinions. I'm, I'm, well, I'm all ears. But this is the kind of stuff that we do in the shop here when we diagnose a crank no start and low rail pressure or running doggy low rail pressure 6.7 you know so definitely bad so have we found contaminated systems yes i love the ones where i take that pcv and it's just crystallized to hell and all you know that death fluid crystallizes what death fluid so the customer's looking at me with a you know thinking i'm stupid i never put death fluid well somebody did pal unless your ex-girlfriend ex-wife pissed you you pissed her off something happened somebody put death fluid in this tank so and by the way, I had a call from a customer on a Titan Cummins V850. Um, they said they flushed after they knew it got deaf and they drove it for 30 minutes with deaf fluid and the fuel and they knew it. They kept driving it. And then they said, oh, better stop. And we flushed the whole system. And I'm like, uh, what agent is out there that you can flush a system and get rid of 100% of that deaf? Water is the only thing. But last time I checked, a pump and injectors don't do well with uh, water. So you tell me, I'm taking those opinions there too. So there you go. All right, there's the caps. Definitely, if you don't have any caps, you want to invest in that. And there is a better view of our PCV there. So therefore, we have our pressure control valve. And there you could see the return line coming off of it too. So like I've said over and over again, it's easy to get to. Maybe you might have to go through the fender well, take the wheel off. Hey, that ain't a whole bunch, you know. That's why I got an apprentice to do that for me. But anyways, uh, it does help a lot there So to get to that PCV. So in this case, you know, when a, what about when there is no contamination, there is a high return? Well, that could be injector. Or you should also make sure you have also checked the VCV. What is going on with the VCV? So there's a picture of a VCV that might be contaminated. So there you go. 